Calendar Календар Адвенту Марко Черемшина A Christmas Carol It isn't the same as any other night, that night before Christmas. It is as if it walks and talks like a church on its feast today. It is as if heaven comes down to caress the earth, as if something whispers to the village. So do those frosts beat their fists against the cottages of the husbandmen. It's as if They are scolding them for some reason. The distant stars seem to be nearer, as if to peer into the cottage windows, as if to convince themselves that the master and the mistress of the household have wheat on their table and they partake of their Christmas Eve supper. The stars are somehow different. They win as if they wanted to say something, one only has to understand them. Perhaps it was they who were guiding the seven carolers through the village, lighting up their caroling. Having seen them through the village, they brought them finally to the forester's cottage by the river. Strolling under the stars, the carolers climbed over all three stiles leading to the forester's household, then, standing beneath its windows, began to carol. Grieving are the hills and the valleys over the poor yield of the harvest. Grieving are the meadows that the cold winter is nigh. Grieving also are the husbandmen that the world has changed for the worse, that there is no truth on God's earth, that people are being destroyed in their prime, that the dark prison is reigning supreme, that the good word is met with a bullet to the brain, for the dark work, for the black betrayal, are asked to the table, a handshake supplied. For the dark wood is the worm in the apple, rust in the iron, yes, and sand in the eye. Hey, but betrayal sits in the village. It can be recognized, hey, poison herbage. He drinks mead, eats salted meat, yet after nightfall stalks through the night, selling his brother, selling his mother, selling his children and a wedded wife. Handsomely dressed and also merry, two powder horns on his chest he carries. Walks he so lightly, acts he so slickly, bringing his brother to betrayal neatly. Into strange prisons the village are leading, sit and recognize his evil dealing. Give him, O oh Lord, your vengeance in plenty, and to the household bread in the pantry, let falseness Perish, faithfulness flourish. Let people know the heart undernourished. Give to the wolves, Lord, pain in their fangs, in their eyes, cataracts, thorns in their sides, noses unsmelling, ears without hearing, as long as the fruits of men's labor they're stealing. Give them rivers that are frozen over, 
forests burned out, mansions ablaze. Give them grain fields that will not produce, Case they will lose, cannons diffused. Give them hills that have been pushed aside, And let their prisons be opened wide. The carolers were singing to blind windows because the forester had closed all his shutters before he sat down at the head of his table to eat with his guests. However, the light broke through the chinks in the shutters, catching the silver breath of the carolers and playing on the Christmas star that they were carrying. The house was melting with heat, so much so that the visiting gendarmes had unbuttoned their uniforms and the host himself had flung his sheepskin vest over one shoulder and mopped his red, sweeting face with a kerchief. The mistress of the house had placed all the Christmas dishes on the oak table and filled the beakers with the drink. But she had spread too much hay under the tablecloth, and the beakers kept rocking and spilling their contents on the uneven surface, which the gendarmes predicted would bring good fortune to the house. The forester put a merry look on his fox-like face and said, with a flourish. Never has this house played host to such agreeable, handsome, and distinguished guests. These dishes and bowls have never held food for such delicate and red lips to consume, and these beakers have never been held by such white, plump, and lordly hands. Come now, help yourselves, my dear and welcomed guests, worthy guardians of the law. The steam rising from the dishes on the table beat against the gendarmes' plump faces, clouding their eyes and getting in the way of their eating and drinking. The shutters suddenly rattled with the sound of peasants' hoarse voices, the house shuddered to its corners. When the commandant heard the caroling outside the window, he became quite agitated and threw himself at his companion. What is this all about? I thought I gave orders to the village that there was to be no caroling except by Kazik Chetetsky, to whom I gave permission. Your orders have been carried out, Master Commandant answered the gendarme. Then what's this? What you are hearing? That's not Kazik's voice, and the carol is not one of ours either. Kazik is there, among them, because Ivan Havrish formed a partnership with him. I met them at the magistrate's, who was also as surprised as you are, commandant. I faced them with my musket, but Kazik waved your permission before my eyes. Don't dare, he said, to arrest these boys, for they are my partners. I have permission, and they are going to carol with me, so that there will be treats for me and for them. I read it, and sure enough he spoke the truth. What a mischief he is! The commandant marveled, softening up. The host interjected timidly at this point, If you please, Master Commandant, that Kazik Chesetsky is not accustomed to any work, not even to caroling. Even under Austria, when he was a cobbler, he wouldn't lift a finger. He wouldn't even look in the direction of work, 
but would lie all summer in the shade and do nothing but whistle. For him, it was enough to catch fish in the stream, to kill a hare in the woods, or to beg a chicken off someone, and that's how he lived among the people of the village. If I may so, Yona, he was a kind of blockhead, and now that he's a big man in the village, how could he go caroling all by himself? Just between you and me, to tell you the truth. He doesn't deserve to be a pole, because, with all respect to God and to your Christians, he is a dissolute idler, and that's all. Who has he become partners with? asked the commandant. With criminals. Who else? answered the host, and explained. Last Wednesday, Ivan Havrish was released from prison. He is that rebel who was the head of the library and the cooperative. And when he heard that Kazik had permission to carol, he went after him. Let's form, he said, a small cooperative. You give your permission, and I'll get the carolers together. Half of what comes in will be for you, and half will go toward the school. And that's just what Kazik wanted, and now they are holding their service. Who else has joined them? Who else but those rifflemen, you know? Those highwaymen, the oprishki. There are only five of them, yet they run the whole village. Those who were imprisoned under Magistrate Paremsky? The same. Well, maybe then we should shut them away now. Not at once, but perhaps later, before dawn. But why so late? Because after our supper you will want, Master Commandant, to go somewhere to play a bit. And uh, Haver's daughter Marichka is the prettiest girl in the village. So... Let the old widow Havrish carol for the school, and we'll go and carol to his daughter. I'll plant an old musket in their passage, and when he comes home, your master gendarme will know what to do. A chain on his wrists, and off with him. The plump hostess didn't hear these last words because she noticed that the carols had ended. So she carried her present outside while the commandant slapped his host on the back and praised him for his advice. The gendarme, delighted, grabbed his revolver and dashed out into the yard where he fired three shots so that the village and the colors would know that the gendarmes were not asleep and that they should have fear. The sound flew over the heads of the carolers and over the village, hit the icy peaks of the mountains and reverberated through the valleys letting the wolves know that the village was singing them a new carol. Read by Evgeny Brazil-Bruszkowski.